In 1995, the World Court in The Hague in the Netherlands met to hear presentations from 22 nations in the biggest, most contentious, most momentous case the judges have ever been asked to consider. As the world's highest court and the judicial arm of the United Nations, the World Court had been asked by two UN bodies, the World Health Organization and the General Assembly itself, to provide an advisory opinion on the legality of the use and threat to use nuclear weapons. Here at the United Nations, the nuclear weapons powers, particularly the United States, Britain and France, brought tremendous pressure on the non-nuclear states to drop the case. But finally, a majority of the non-nuclear states voted in favor of calling for a ruling from the World Court on the legality of the use and threat to use nuclear weapons, pointing out that 50 years into the advent of the nuclear age, still the nuclear powers have not agreed to halt testing have not agreed to abolish nuclear weapons, have given no guarantee they will not build new nuclear weapons, and have given no assurance they will not use nuclear weapons. We are confident that the results of your deliberations on the subject under examination by this court will be of paramount importance to the development of the human civilization. Nuclear weapons are by their nature illegal under customary international law by virtue of fundamental general principles of humanity. I want to record at the outset New Zealand's outrage at the resumption of French nuclear testing in our region of the world. South Pacific countries have had to put up with nuclear testing for far too long. The international community must turn up the pressure on nuclear weapons. Simply put, the world must now be rid of them. The unspeakable atrocities and agonies suffered by the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki must never be repeated anywhere in the world. A single modern weapon exploded either intentionally or accidentally over a large city is capable of slaughtering more than one million people. It should be noted, however, that no matter where in the world nuclear weapons are used, the effects could be global. The global radioactive fallout from Chernobyl and from atmospheric nuclear testing demonstrate the global effects that would occur from the use of just a small proportion of the world's arsenals. Can intelligence have emerged in 15 billion years only to be eliminated in a few minutes. Australia also announced at The Hague that it was setting up a commission in Canberra as the first independent effort by a nation to prepare a blueprint for the political and scientific architecture of a nuclear-free world. Our Prime Minister announced last week that we would establish a group of knowledgeable, imaginative and distinguished individuals from around the world to produce a report on how to achieve a nuclear weapons free world as soon as possible, outlining the practical steps that would need to be taken to achieve that goal. For the first time in its history, the court received petitions from non-governmental organizations. More than three million petitions calling on the court to declare nuclear weapons illegal have been signed by millions of citizens and hundreds of world leaders, including Nobel Peace Prize winners, the Dalai Lama, Mikhail Gorbachev and Archbishop Tutu. Another Nobel Peace Prize winner, physicist Joseph Rotblat, had been asked to prepare testimony for the court, marking the first time the court has received a presentation from an expert witness. In the early 1940s, Joseph Rotblat had worked on the Manhattan Project that built the first bomb. 
he became the first scientist to resign when it was learned that Hitler had no nuclear bomb and was not planning to build a bomb. Rotblatt was widely criticized at the time for withdrawing his support. He went on to join Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell in Pugwash, the international movement to abolish nuclear weapons. In 1995, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his work with Pugwash. Following his submission to the court hearings in The Hague, Joseph Rotbutt also became a member of the newly established Australian Canberra Commission on Nuclear Disarmament. In my opinion, every move is important. The worst enemy is to keep it off the agenda. And then we, people don't talk about this. They forget there is a nuclear issue. And of course, then the nuclear weapon states will be very happy because they want to keep on retaining their nuclear weapons. Therefore, every action which can be taken, which puts it on the agenda, whatever the outcome may be, I think it's important that people talk about it and people realize that we are not living in a world of absolute security. We are living actually in a world in which we are not secure because as long as nuclear weapons exist, there's always the danger they'll be used. From this point of view, I welcome every action, whether it is the campaign for the World Court or the Canberra Commission. As the nations argued their cases in The Hague, they repeatedly drew on Joseph Rotblatt's warnings on the unique dangers of nuclear weapons. Zimbabwe would draw your attention to the research of Prof Professor Rotblatt in nuclear radiation in warfare, which concludes that even a one kiloton nuclear bomb would produce sufficient radiation to cause unnecessary suffering, be indiscriminate and affect the territories of third states. It is known that nuclear weapons produce indiscriminate effects principally on account of the radioactive fallout and electromagnetic impulsion. The Solomon Islands isn't just saying this, but Professor Rudblad. Every nation that called for nuclear weapons to be declared illegal drew attention to the unique threat of nuclear radiation. Some radiation remains lethal for 250,000 years. It is in the nature of nuclear weapons to cause immediate indiscriminate mass destruction and delayed long-lasting life-destroying radiation of survivors, resulting in an overwhelming medical catastrophe. Indeed, consideration of lethal effects radiation over time provides a link between the principle which provides for the protection of civilian populations <coughs> and the principle which provides for protection of the environment. The development of the principle of intergenerational equity has been gathering pace over the last several decades, but as long ago as 1972 found expression in the Stockholm Declaration on the Human Environment. The first principle that declaration speaks of, quote, a solemn responsibility to protect and improve the environment for present and future generations. The horror of nuclear weapons derives, of course, from their tremendous destructive power, but equally from radiation, the effects of which extend across generations. Fifty years after the end of the war, people continue to suffer from exposure to radiation. What could be more clear? Nuclear weapons are more cruel and inhumane than any other weapons banned thus far by international law. The most fundamental difference between nuclear and conventional weapons is that nuclear weapons release radioactivity at the time of explosion. All people exposed to radiation during the one minute period of the Nagasaki explosion died within two weeks. Induced radiation due to absorption of plutonium and other radioactive fallout scattered by the winds cause widespread radioactive contamination. The legal counsel for the Marshall Islands, the scene of the American nuclear bomb tests in the Pacific, made a detailed and dramatic presentation to the court. There's been extensive documentation of birth defects attributed to radioactive contamination from the nuclear weapons tests. A research program conducted in the Marshall Islands between 1975 and 1991 showed a, quote, strong correlation between the incidence of congenital anomalies and distance from bikini, end quote. Damage to the environment of the Marshall Islands from the nuclear weapons test has also been documented. Resettlement of evacuated islands has not been fully achieved 
due to the environmental impact of the tests, including the contamination of soil and the uptake of cesium into otherwise edible plant life. Dangerous levels of residual radioactivity have kept areas on four atolls entirely off limits. For the first time, the court heard testimony from a victim, a survivor of the radiation released during the American nuclear bomb tests in the Marshall Islands. As a result of the radiation poisoning, I cannot have children. I have had miscarriage on seven occasions. Despite the overwhelming evidence presented on the dangers of radiation, the only nuclear nation even to make reference to nuclear radiation was the United States in a single, brief, inconclusive, and dismissive reference. As we have explained in some detail in our submissions, nuclear weapons are not and have never been treated as poison weapons for purposes of the 1907 Fourth Hague Convention or gas weapons for purposes of the 1925 Geneva Protocol. The 1954 definition of atomic weapons that was referred to yesterday by counsel for the Solomon Islands does not imply anything to the contrary. That definition includes both nuclear weapons and the separate category of what are known today as radiological weapons, which are designed to cause poisoning, for example, through the deliberate spreading of radiological substances over an area. The nuclear weapon states also argued that there was no law specifically forbidding nuclear weapons. Among all the nu numerous treaties which deal with weaponry, there is not one, not one, which addresses the legality of using nuclear weapons. Whether the use or threatened use of nuclear weapons in any particular case is lawful must depend upon all the circumstances. The French government maintains that it is both unjustified and legally impossible to deduce from current general rules, whichever they may be, a principle banning the threat or use of nuclear weapons. The Security Council resolution, as a matter of fact, says that only the use of nuclear weapons by an aggressor, but not any use of nuclear weapons per se, would constitute a violation of the UN Charter. None of the referenced human rights or environmental instruments prohibits either expressly or by implication the use of nuclear weapons. It is also our view that there is no general prohibition in customary international law on the use of nuclear weapons. Under the law of armed conflict, in the absence of an express prohibition, the legality of the use of any weapon, including nuclear weapons, is fundamentally dependent on the fact and circumstances of the use in question. The nuclear weapon states also argued before the court that nuclear weapons could be safe. The assumptions made by the World Health Organization and the materials submitted to the court are in fact highly selective. The four scenarios on which the World Health Organization report focuses address civilian casualties expected to result from nuclear attacks involving significant numbers of large urban area targets or a substantial number of military targets. But no reference is made in the report to the effects to be expected from other plausible scenarios, such as a small number of accurate attacks by low-yield weapons against an equally small number of military targets in non-urban areas. Furthermore, nuclear weapons are today capable of precise targeting. Nuclear weapons, as is true of conventional weapons, can be used in a variety of ways. They can be deployed to achieve a wide range of military objectives of varying degrees of significance. They can be targeted in ways that either increase or decrease resulting incidental civilian injury or collateral damage, and their use may be lawful or not, depending upon whether and to what extent such use was prompted by another belligerent's conduct and the nature of such conduct. Other nations challenged the nuclear power's assurances. The proponents of theories of limited nuclear war and deterrence based on such theories ask all of us to make assumptions about control over the use of weapons and human reliability in crisis management 
that cannot, in fact, be supported. Mistakes, accidents, loss of control are commonplace in human experience. We have now a battery of adjectives with less repulsive, almost appealing connotations to describe the new generations of nuclear weapons. Clean bombs, low yield bombs, nukes, tactical nuclear weapons, all of which we are told can be used in precise surgical operations. Almost nuclear war toys for nuclear war games. There is much conjecture in all that, bordering on science fiction. Throughout the hearings, representatives of United Nations NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and other disarmament groups maintained a vigil outside the court. Three NGOs had worked for nearly 20 years to have the case brought before the court. The International Peace Bureau, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, and the International Lawyers Against Nuclear Arms. They had formed a group called the World Court Project, which had initiated the original effort with the World Health Organization to bring the case to the court. Some of the nuclear nations had complained at the role of the NGOs. The government of the United Kingdom notes in its submission on the General Assembly's request at page one that the requests, to quote, are the result of a sustained campaign by a group of non-governmental organizations which have long been active in promoting what they have termed the World Court Project, unquote. My government is not at all offended by the involvement of NGOs in this matter. One of the NGOs initiating the World Court Project is the World Peace Bureau. Its president, Mai Britt Turin, is the former Swedish disarmament minister, a minister of the European Parliament, and a member of the Australian Canberra Commission on Nuclear Abolition. And remember one thing, they have never ever in the world been produced a weapon which has not been used. Never, ever. So that's why the initiative from the Australian government is so essential. We should be under no illusions about the size of the task of nuclear disarmament which confronts the international community. More than 40,000 nuclear warheads exist in the world today with a total destructive power around a million times greater than that of the bomb which flattened Hiroshima. One of the founding members of the New Zealand World Court Project is Katie Dews. The question of legality is terribly important because it will underpin any negotiations that go on from now towards abolition. I mean, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, while having a legal basis, has not really come from the people, whereas this particular initiative has come from the people, and they will make sure that their governments are held accountable on this particular issue. Although the hearings continued for two weeks in The Hague, virtually no mainstream media covered the case. One exception was America's Court TV channel, a unique 24-hour television station covering court cases from the O.J. Simpson case to the Bosnian war crimes. In a week-long series of programs, they alone provided in-depth coverage, discussion, and debate of the World Court hearings on the bomb. The uh, international agreements on the subject not only do not prohibit nuclear weapons, but they clearly are proceeding on the premise that there are lawful uses and possession of nuclear weapons. The Non-Proliferation Treaty says nothing about the lawful use. The Non-Proliferation Treaty takes the world as it is. We have a world in which a few states have nuclear weapons. We have a world in which all the other states would like to be rid of the damn things. The court finally announced its opinion. Around the world, news reports reflected widely varied interpretations. The court concluded that the use and threat to use nuclear weapons were subject to international law and would generally be contrary to the rules of war. The court condemned nuclear arms as the ultimate evil and noted that the nuclear weapon states were obliged to pursue and conclude negotiations for nuclear disarmament. However, in a complex and controversial ruling on the central issue, the court revealed deep divisions and finally voted by a narrow margin that they were unable to determine whether or not the use of nuclear weapons would be illegal in extreme circumstances of self-defense in which the survival of a state would be at stake. The overall decision brought variously hope, disappointment, 
and in a cartoon in the New Zealand Otago Daily Times, ridicule. And so the United Nations still has no definitive answer to the request for a decision on the legality of the use and threat to use nuclear weapons. And some of the nuclear weapons countries, including the United States and Britain, say that the World Court decision means that under certain circumstances, they can legally use nuclear weapons even in a first strike. As a result, some of the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations, are considering calling on the United Nations to request a clarifying opinion from the World Court on some of the more ambiguous aspects of their controversial decision, saying that there is no room for uncertainty or loopholes in a law that ultimately concerns the possible extinction of the human species. However, at a United Nations news conference following the decision, most non-governmental groups welcomed those aspects of the court's ruling that seemed to demand a change in the policy of nuclear weapons nations. Leonard Marx, chairman of the New York Lawyers Alliance for World Security, pointed out that the decision specifically calls for the abolition of nuclear weapons. The court has indicated unanimously that the nuclear weapons powers are under a, uh, unanimously, they're under an obligation to negotiate the disarmament of nuclear weapons. It's time now for all countries and citizens to push toward the abolition of nuclear weapons with a nuclear abolition treaty. I would like to state categorically that this is a great victory for women, men, children, and all living things. And that if states obey the court and its president, and as law-abiding people, we should. We should all be, they should, they, the states, should all be sitting down at a table right now to work out clear, complete nuclear disarmament. And Daniel Ellsberg, former United States Defense Department official, explained that the court's decision places new restrictions on the circumstances in which the use and threat to use nuclear weapons may be legal. It spells out those circumstances in new international legal language. Uh, extreme circumstance of self-defense in which the very survival of a stake might be at stake. Now that is a very strong narrowing of the circumstances in which use or threat might be legal from the definitions or the conditions used by my own state, the United States, or other nuclear weapon states. The responses of the nuclear weapon states have been terse. The United States State Department interpreted the decision to mean that the use and the threat of use of nuclear weapons can be justified and can be legal under current international law. In Britain, the government concluded that the court did not rule that nuclear weapons were illegal and the opinion of the court has no implications at all for our defense policy. At the United Nations, NGOs disagreed. The nuclear states are wrong on two accounts with us. Firstly, the court says that the use and threat to use nuclear weapons is generally illegal. And this would make uh, the policies of the nuclear states illegal. Uh, the only circumstance in which the court said they didn't know was in the extreme circumstance of the very survival of a nuclear state. Secondly, the court said that the nuclear states have an obligation to begin and conclude negotiations on the elimination of nuclear weapons, and they're not doing that. So what the United Nations will likely do this year at the General Assembly will call on the nuclear states to start such negotiations for the elimination of nuclear weapons. People don't realize that the, that the nuclear war, which we've been talk, writing about, terrible consequences of the war, but we never thought, really thought that it may lead not just to a, perhaps a millions of people dying, as we would describe it normally, and other people suffering and so on, but actually with the extinction of the human race. It is possible now. It's become possible. Therefore, we really just become, become a real danger for the, to the continued existence of the human species. Now, the first step to prevent it is to remove the instrument which can lead to such a catastrophe. And this is the reason why our immediate objective is the elimination of nuclear weapons. Well, firstly, I'm a mother, and I'm a mother of three children. And I had a hope that my children would live within a period of time that was nuclear-free. 
But my greatest hope that has kept me going is that one day I will hold a grandchild who has been born into this world without the fear of nuclear annihilation. Thank you.